She says that we were waiting. We were waiting for customers. I said, you know, I have been here a long time. And I don't know. It just seems particularly a bad vibe going on right now. The demon lady says, it's Christmas on Earth today. And that's always the worst day in hell. And I thought, hell? Oh, gee, <laughs> you know, that wasn't good. I did to have that thrown at me and, oh, my mind was going crazy. And uh, that Christmas, I start singing a Christmas carol. And uh, my favorite one, she screamed. And she says, stop that. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world right now. I am Louisa, your host, and I'm so excited to share the story of our guest today, Kathy McDaniel. Kathy McDaniel experienced a haunting NDE where she faced horrors and eternal hell. Kathy fought for her life in a drug induced coma for three weeks experiencing hell, culminating in her eventual glimpse of heaven. Kathy is the author of Misfits in Hell to Heaven Expat. This is her story and this is her passion. Kathy McDaniel, so honoured and excited to have you on the show today. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What a profound, we were just speaking before, but what a profound experience, near-death experience you have had. If you feel called and don't mind, do you mind just explaining to the audience how you, what, 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 were your, what was your illness or your accident or how you found yourself in this situation or the events leading up to it? Um, up to that time, I'd been a real estate property manager. I had my own company and uh, I had been in several relationships. I lived in all over the United States. Uh, I had a you know, pretty full life. And then uh, I had been engaged to a, a young man that I just loved dearly. And uh, because of both of us in our careers, um, he got transferred to the East Coast and we were living on the West Coast. And I knew that once he moved, he would be 24 seven at the office. And I had my own company and my own family there. So we, we split up, but stayed really good friends. In fact, uh, he bought a house and I rented it from him. So we were, we were in touch all the time, but a couple of years later, he gave me a phone call and said, I have to talk to you. And he came out to visit and told me he had leukemia and uh, it was particularly virulent type. He was going to go up to Seattle and um, have some, as a research hospital and they were going to do what they could. He was only 53 years old and I was I was just shocked. And uh, I said, sure. And by that time I'd sold my business. So I um, left California, went up to Seattle, found us a home and uh, he had another caregiver and uh, we started and they said it would be three to five months, but it was, it, it turned into seven. And uh, by that time, the other caregiver had broken her foot. And so now I was taking care of both of them. And we lived about a block from the hospital and it was just back and forth to and from the hospital. He'd be better, he'd be worse, he'd be better, he'd be worse. And then he died. And I was just heartbroken. I was exhausted. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know whether to go back to my hometown. I didn't have a job. It was, it was too much. And so when a flu came around, very much like what's going around now, I caught it and, um, uh, a friend that I had met here got me to a dock in the box just as I felt my life just kind of slipping away. He got me into the emergency room and they couldn't find a pulse. They put me in an ambulance, took me to the hospital. I remember waking up there for a short period of time and my family was all there and I thought, what's going on? But they had told them that I was really ill, that I had now had been pneumonia had got into ARDS, which was a res acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is lung failure, which is what people die of when they get COVID or anything else, it's, it's lung failure. So they were gonna have to intubate me, give me a nice trach scar and throw me in a coma. And so the last thing I remember is giving the, my dad a thumbs up as he was waving through the hospital. 
window. And uh, they told me that I would not remember anything, that they were going to give me white amnesia. And that, that meant that they didn't want me remembering poking and prodding and machines and all that stuff. So I just said, OK. And I went away. And I don't know when it was. In comas, you can kind of, your soul can kind of drift around uh, when you're not in control of everything. And, I ended up in this pitch dark, silent space. And when I opened my eyes, I thought I was in a closet. I thought, what's going on? And I, I was afraid to move because I didn't know if I was standing on something or it was just crazy. And all of a sudden I noticed that, that the, it was kind of this reddish glow that started to come out of the darkness and I thought, well, maybe that's a light I, I'm coming out of the room. But then I started hearing things like screeches and moans and, and then it was kind of foggy and it was, it smelled terrible and I was getting hot and I thought, Oh no. Uh, and then this voice just boomed out of the, the, the red fog. It just said, do you know where you are? And I'd seen a lot of Bella Lugosi movies when I was growing up as a kid. And I thought, hell? And then the voice just boomed back with this maniacal laugh. Whoa. Scared the living, you know, what out of me. And I just turned and ran. And um, that's when it started. I, I didn't know where I was. I never felt dead. I just thought I was in a very strange place and I didn't know how I got there. But gosh, I was a survivor. I mean, I, I was a Girl Scout, man, and I knew that I had to, to survive. And, and so the scene opened up, it, it got lighter, it was still not light, but I could see that it was like a bombed out city. Uh, it was like New York City or something, and it was buildings had toppled over and there was fires in the distance and smoke. And, and uh, it was just a war, obviously. I mean, and I thought, oh my God, they dropped a bomb. <laughs> And I'm in this mess. So I've, there's concrete, big chunks of concrete rebar sticking out of them and smoke and stuff. So I thought, this is a dangerous situation. I need to find a place to, to hide so I can figure out what's going on. So I kind of tucked into this crevice and shaking. I thought, oh my God, what do I start? And I thought, well, I, I've got to find, a, you know, maybe there's other people that survived. I've got to find people. So I'm kind of looking around, but I started hearing like this scuttling noises. And uh, it sounded like great big spiders or something crawling around. And I thought, oh, I watched way too many horror movies when I was on my whole life. And I, I thought, oh, gosh, darn it. I, I, so, but then I thought I saw somebody like hunkered down in another piece of concrete over there. And, and, but I was afraid to go out because I didn't know what creatures were out there. And then all the moaning and stuff, I thought there's some very unhappy people I don't want to run into. So I just kind of took a chance and I yelled out. I said, um, hello, oh, hello. Uh, uh, why don't we get together? You know, ding dong here, still think she's alive. And I said, I'll go find water. You find fire or, or something and, and we'll, we'll see if there's other survivors. And he just... His voice just came out dull. We are all alone here. Gosh. Uh, okay. Then these other creatures in the mist started, uh, they'd seen me. And um, so I thought, crud, I got to get out of here. So I took a run for it. I thought I saw a spot where I could climb up and get over a piece of concrete. But I got up to the top and I slid down. And so there was some interaction with these characters. Uh, they were depressed um, and they left me. And all of a sudden, it was like somebody switched a movie on a television channel and I was in another place. And so I was, and everything was so out of control. And this time it was a demon. I mean, there's no other word for it. And um, he was really big and really mean and really ugly. And again, I'm confused and I'm thinking, <laughs> this is looking worse and worse. Um, he, he was gonna torment me and he, there's this huge 
blackberry field, as far as you can see, with big, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a blackberry field, but they send out these runners and they are full of big stickers and they intertwine and all that stuff. And, and uh, he says, um, you are going to just spare. And I said, no, I, I don't despair. I'm going to get out of here. And he says, no, you, you won't give up. And I said, no, I won't. And he says, well, I tell you what, I can get you out of here. All you have to do is one thing. And I said, sure, what? And he said, see that blackberry field? And I says, yeah. He says, you have to cut it all down. I said, OK. And then he hands me this pair of scissors, like for kindergarten cutting paper. And I thought, you SOB, you're just toying with me. And this is this is serious. And I'm okay. I said, give me the scissors. So I scrooched down between all these vines and I was getting cut up and it was it was horrible. So I thought, I'll die trying. I still didn't think I was dead. So I'm, I'm gnawing away at one of these things and I finally pull it away. And as I did, I turned for the next one and it grew back. And he starts laughing, that horrible laugh. And um, I just looked at him and I just, I just let down again and I looked at him and I started cutting again. And boom, I was in another place. And I thought, oh, this, you know, it was just so unnerving. It was so, I couldn't stop to think about it because I knew I, I, I had to keep going. And so one thing, it got worse and it got worse and it got worse, but I still would not do what they told me to do. Uh, there was one horrible incident in a, a hospital. I was all of a sudden in a hospital hallway, as long as far as you could see, it was bright lights everywhere, but there were doors, 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 doors. And boom, I just landed there. So I, I'm looking around. I, I didn't have a chance to do anything because here comes another demon, a big one. And he's, it's just like, a, like Bigfoot or something but ugly coming down the hall and had a club thing. And I just kind of froze and he says, okay, this is your job. And I said, job? And he says, yes, you are gonna go into that room on your right. You are gonna take what they give you and you're gonna come across the hall into that room on the left. And you're going to put that object down and you're gonna go back and you're gonna go forth and you go back and go forth. I thought, well, Okay, I'll check it out. So I went into this room, and as far as I could see was women up on, they were on like operating table beds with their legs spread and towels over them and stuff. As far as they were just lined up like cookie cutter things as far as you could see. And I thought, oh my God, it dawned on me what they were doing. They were doing abortions. And I had worked in a pro- life group when I was, you know, on earth. I, I, I didn't agree with that sort of thing. And so uh, this doctor raised his hand and I didn't know what to do. And he turned around, he says, come here. And so I went over and he had what was left of this little baby body and he slopped it into my arms. He was covered with blood, there was blood everywhere. And he says, well, go take it to the room. So I was like in shock. So I, I kind of walked gingerly trying not to look at this poor little creature. And I went out into the hall and the demon just pointed his, his club and says, over there. So I was, I was starting to cry. I went over and I opened the door and as far as you can see were mounds and mounds, like a Costco warehouse, mounds of these little baby bodies everywhere. Stench was unbelievable. And I put the little body down and I came back in the hall and he pointed the other way. And I said, no, I am not gonna do that. And he, he raises his, oh yeah, you are. And I says, no, I'm not. And I thought, maybe he'll kill me, that would be great. So, boom, I'm in another place. And this went on and on and on. And sometimes I would find myself on a road and as far as I could see, it was just desolate because it was only this like twilight. There was no stars or moon or anything like that. It was just twilight. And I could kind of make out maybe cactus sometime or, or a big pile of rocks. And then on the, on the pathway, it was, you know, it, was, it was just dirt and rocks and stuff. And, and I, there was no signs or anything. 
I just picked a way to go and I just started and walked and walked and walked. It was better. It was better in being in these situations, but um, it was, you know, it was a bad deal. And then I, on that road, uh, this whole thing, if I had to, when I got back, when people say, well, how, how long were you there? I said, gosh, didn't have my watch. Uh, it, was, it was a lot. <laughs> a, lo- a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was like, I don't know if you ever went to uh, uh, the gambling casinos in Vegas or something. Uh, you, you go in at three o'clock in the afternoon. There's no windows. There's no light change. There's no clocks. And you have no idea how long you're there. And you go out and it's four in the morning. You go, holy cow. Well, it was, it was like that. There was no sensation. There was no time. But if I think about all the things I did and all that, you know, and the time in between, um, it was like two years. I'd grab two years and say that's what it felt like. In so a perpetual hell of sorts or purgatory. And it never got any better. And you were all alone worse. as well. I had nobody to talk to or anything until... On the road one time between these things, um, I started smelling something really good. And I was so hungry and tired and thirsty. I didn't know I was dead. I still felt like I was alive. So I came to this like, I don't know, picnic area or something on the side. And there was tables of food and uh, tables were set and there was flowers. And, and I thought, huh? <laughs> Great. And when the woman that was preparing the food turned around, it was somebody I knew, it was somebody in my family who was alive. And that perpetuated my feeling that I was alive. And I said, oh, thank, you know, thank heavens you're here. I am so hungry. Can I please just have a little bit of overflowing food on all these tables? And she says, no, this is not for the likes of you. And I was shocked because we were very close. And I said, what? And I could see this man sitting there. And it was like he was overseeing what she was going to say. And she was dressed funny. And it wasn't like something she would do. She was, and I thought, oh, no, you know, you know, this is very wrong. I don't know what to do. Got back on the road. Kept going. Kept going. Kept going. Um, each experience broke you down, but you had such a strength to continue. I... What are you going to do? I mean, I mean, sure, you could start crying and feel sorry for yourself and sit down, but God, what would happen to you then? I mean, I just thought, no, there's got to be a way out. There's one road, maybe, <laughs> you know, I could take a freeway exit somewhere down the road, but I just kept going. I had no choice, really, as far as I was concerned. Um, but I did eventually come to a really horrible town uh it was the first time i'd really seen people well they were kind of people i don't know if you've ever seen night of the living dead but this was like zombies zombie zombie people and they were all in tattered clothing and walking funny and and it was very dark and they were careful not to run into each other they'd growl like i say i i must have seen too many bad movies but that's what it was like and I thought, oh gosh, I just thought I was in trouble before. There's a whole, you know, this, I don't know, 20, 30 people I could see just right there. And um, they didn't look normal and they didn't look happy. And I thought, well, I'll just keep my eyes down and I'll just kind of skirt around here and walk kind of slow and not, not alert them that I was here. But they, they noticed. And one would stop and then another would stop. And then the women came out of the group. You could kind of tell by the way they were dressed and, and couldn't see their faces real well. But you could see the guys, just the men, just closing in on me. And uh, it was a terrible experience. I was attacked all by all those men at the same time. I and mean, they did terrible things to me and beat me up. And the- Pray for death is what you do, but you're dead already. I just, uh, when it was all over and they all, the last guy came up and into my face and I noticed his skin was falling off. And he says, uh, we all have AIDS and now you've got it and you can't die. You're just going to become like us. Oh my God. Kick me, 
and your worst up. nightmares and fears. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I just huddled. I kind of got my clothes back together as best I could and just sat there and I didn't know what to do or where to go. And this woman came up, kind of a woman, said, show with us, get in line. And I noticed when I got up that there were other women like me who had been attacked and abused and she was leading us somewhere and I had to go. So that um, led to another situation and... Um, Not a positive. <laughs> no. Um, and it was must, I mean, the things about, the thing is about near-death experiences, people say it's so real. It's not even like a dream. It's so vivid. No, you are, you are experiencing everything as if you were on hyper alert in danger on earth. But on danger on earth, you've got a chance. Down there, there was nobody that would help you. They were all in the same boat. And um, it was, it, I was getting kind of run down and uh, uh, trying so hard not to give up. And so there was a long period there where we went to another place and we were told we were going to have a new occupation, which was not a good one. And uh, so we were all kind of sitting around in this horrible cabin. It was not insulated, there's snow up to Kazang. We've been trudging through the snow, I don't know how long, you know, freezing. And, and uh, I was just sitting there and she says that we were waiting. We were waiting for customers and uh, I said, you know, I have been here a long time. And I don't know, it just seems particularly a bad vibe going on right now. And uh, the demon lady says, well, of course there is. It's heaven, it's not heaven. It's Christmas on earth today. And that's always the worst day in hell. And I thought, hell? Oh, gee, <laughs> you know, that wasn't good it, I did, to have that thrown at me. And, uh, oh, my mind was going crazy. And um, I thought Christmas. I start singing a Christmas carol. And uh, my favorite one. And she screamed. She's on the other side of the, it wasn't a very big room, but it was full of us women, almost shoulder to shoulder. And she says, stop that. I just kept going and I'm singing away in a manger, no crib for his head. And the other ladies started singing too, one by one. And uh, she was having a fit. She was screaming and pushing people and everything, trying to get to me. And we came to the little Lord and she shrieked. And it was white, white light everywhere. And I felt this infusion of love and joy. And I, I just, you know, I just didn't know what to do. It was just so glorious and so wonderful. And I forgot everything that had gone before. I was so um, just, uh, you know, people have been there, there's no words. Um, it's wonderful. And as I looked around, I saw my friend, the one that had died the month before, my, you know, my ex-fiance, and, and, and he looked great. And I thought, wow, the last time I saw him, you know, he, he had no hair, he was all blotchy, and his, you know, he was just miserable. And uh, now he looked like he was about 35 years old. His hair wasn't gray anymore, and he looked healthy, and he was wearing a sweater I gave him. Christmas or his birthday or something, I was totally confused. I mean, I was feeling so great. And, you know, what could be better than to see him? So I thought, oh, he doesn't know he's dead. And, you know, I just, it just dawned on me that he was dead. And, and he just started laughing. And I thought, well, I didn't say anything. He must have, he must have, he's, he's reading my mind. And I thought, oh my God, if he's dead, then I'm dead. Thank God. <laughs> you know, 
this is wonderful. Oh my God, this is terrific. And I just was just, just so happy. And he didn't come toward me. He didn't, you know, I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, where's all the angels and stuff? Come on, let's, let's go see. And he, he just paused for a minute and flashed through my mind because I looked over on the side, on the right side, against a wall. There was a great big like architect's table with a great big book and it was open about halfway. And um, all of a sudden I got this flash of him showing me this book and how I said, no, that's gonna be too hard. I'm gonna stay here with you. And I looked up and he just said, yeah, Mary Kay, that's what we call him. You've got too much left to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was furious. I said, no, no, no. And um, boom, <laughs> they have more power than you do over there. And uh, luckily, a lot of people experience kind of a, a halfway place, kind of to cool off before you come back. Mine was a, a beautiful meadow and a beautiful stream. And I just started walking downhill on the stream where I met a couple of people who gave me messages and things. And, and then I woke up and I didn't know where I was and I couldn't move. I was so hot. I, I was scared. I thought, oh my God, the demons have me again. And um, so there was my mom and my daughter and son-in-law and my dad. And, and I'm so confused. And I thought, why are they staring at me? And why can't I move? And then my daughter came over and says, now mom, you've been really sick and you've been in a coma for three weeks. And I thought, what? And, and uh, you're, 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 you're very thin, you, you, you know, you, but you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. Uh, you're out of the coma and, and you're gonna make it. I was so angry. I was so angry at my friend. <laughs> I thought I'm gonna get you for this. I'll hunt you down. Um, so that's when it started with coming back. I weighed 86 pounds. I had no muscle mass. I couldn't move anything. I could move this finger and blink. I was hot because they had me all wrapped up in, in blankets and I, I, I get claustrophobia. So I, oh God, I was losing my mind with that. I couldn't move. And um, it was, uh, I'd been in ICU for three weeks and they had told them at one point that I wasn't gonna make it. I had started off at a 38% chance of making it. They, back then, this is 21 years ago, they didn't have all the, um, knowledge that they do now or the machinery with the um, ventilators, you know, they either put too much pressure on them and they blew your lungs up or they let the peeps, they call it, get too low and they would collapse and then stick together. And one of mine had, it had already collapsed and stuck together. And I, one lung is not as good as the other anymore, but I still had one. And, um, and they just, they wouldn't give up. They had been sitting out there for three weeks praying. They said, oh my gosh, we have a prayer circle going around the globe. And I thought, I will get you for this. <laughs> I will. <laughs> now, what a mean thing to do. I mean, thank God I couldn't talk. I mean, I had the thing in my throat and, and all that. And thank God, because I, I was a terribly in, ungrateful person. Um, and, and it took time. They finally were able to give me some kind of thing where I talk like a robot. So I... I, you know, and then they said that um, they would start with a the physical therapy and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything, nothing. And uh, I was like a rag doll and that's so humiliating. And, and uh, I was an independent, you know, person, you know, and so I was totally dependent for air, food, anything, tube down the throat for feeding and um, hard lesson. I really feel for all these COVID people I see them coming out of the hospital and everybody's going, yay. And I'm thinking, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> You've got such a rehab ahead of you. But I'm just saying, hang in there. It will be okay. Just hang in there. Don't give up. If you need to talk to somebody, give me a call. <laughs> um, or get on my website or something because you can come back. It takes time. But uh, I mean, they told me that she, she probably won't walk again. She won't drive a car. She's going to be you know, a 
burden to her family. No, I won't. I decided if I was back, I was back. I want my life back. And I worked hard. And they finally I had to argue with the insurance lady. They wanted to let me die in a convalescent home. And I said, no, damn it. I had my own business. I've, I'm a, you know, I'm a person that you know, deserves to be here and I'll make you eat your words. So I was in a, a rehab facility for physical therapy for a month. Every week I had to get a certain amount of things done or my insurance company was going to pull the plug. So I had to work and it was hard, hard, hard work. And then I, they, then I had to gain weight. They wouldn't let me out until I weighed a hundred. And that after a month I was at 99 because, oh, your stomach's all shrunk up and nothing tastes good. And, and um, uh, all the other people, <laughs> there's a lot of people there for strokes and diabetes and stuff. And they're all on this eating lettuce and I've got big heaping things of, you know, uh, mashed potatoes and, and they're all going, <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> but anyway, finally the nurse, she was so sweet. She says, I, I was a 99, 99. Finally, she's put her toe on the end. She's Oh, hundred pounds. And I says, Oh, great. So she wrote it down and I got out. So after two months in the hospital, I got to go out and um, start rehab. Uh, I would live getting my life back. I was very fortunate. The, the fellow I had been dating for a very short period of time had stuck through it. And, uh, we eventually got married and thank God I had no home. I had no income. I mean, I had no insurance. I mean, God bless him. He was synchronicity. Uh, uh, later on, I saved his life to literally from cancer. But so it was, it was a hard time. Nobody wanted to hear about it. They said it was the drugs. It was uh, um, a dream. You know, it would go away and it didn't. I had, I was afraid to close my eyes that I was afraid the demons weren't going to come back and drag me back to hell. And so I always used to be a writer, you know, just stuff. I had a diary since I was like in sixth grade. And so I started writing it out. I thought, well, if I could just write all this out of my head. Maybe I can have some peace because it was just consuming me. It was not going away. And so um, I was home for a long time uh, before I was able to get out and do things. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, wrote. And fast forward on, I got my life back. It took a full year uh, to be able to say that, but that's not bad considering how horrible I was. And then nobody would help me with this. I didn't know whether to go to a shrink. Um, I didn't know what to do. I suffered. I suffered a lot with that, that uh, um, unknowing, you know, why, why, trauma. why me? I mean, I was a good Catholic girl. I wasn't perfect, but that was not okay. I mean, I had been taught from a very early age, you know, as a Catholic that you know, well, nobody but like Mother Teresa goes straight to heaven. You know, we all go to purgatory, we get our sins burned off, and then we can, you know, appear pure before God. So I bought it, you know, I lived that that way. I believed it and I believe I manifested it, you know, because it took 10 years to find IONS, the International Association of Near Death Studies. And that They're was wonderful. Epic. Oh my God, they saved my life. They really did. And, and through all these weird synchronicities, I, I didn't want to go there. I had to drive all the way to Seattle and the traffic's miserable and it's an hour drive and, and I fought it every time. But, you know, you get this voice, everybody's got the voice, you, you hear it. Uh, it's your conscience, your guardian angel, your higher self, whatever. But boy, after a trip where I was, it's loud. <laughs> and it's not like I don't say, voice, tell me, should I do this or that? It, it goes, get in the car, grab your keys, and get your butt up there. I mean, it was like, okay, okay. Uh, but I finally went, and I went a couple of times, but it finally heard Evan Alexander. You know, he's 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 not a kook. You know, he's a reputable or a surgeon that was an atheist. And, and, I, I, and I met this wonderful girl, again, synchronistically speaking. Uh, I didn't want to go. The voice says, you got to meet somebody. I got up there. I was hiding. And this lady came and sat next to me. And, and I said, I was meant to meet you. And she says, I know. And I said, what do you mean, you know? She says, well, didn't the voice tell you? And I says, yeah. She says, oh, you'll get used to it. So now I had a buddy. I had somebody to go up there. And, and, and so I went to meetings for years and years and finally got the guts to tell my story because, gee, we never hear the hell stories. That'll be fun. Uh, yeah, uh, it was the natural storyteller and we got up there and I was not going to do it, but my friend said it and her name's Louisa. 
Uh, that's a synchronicity, huh? Yeah. Um, I only know two, you and her. Okay. <laughs> so she says, I'll sit in the front row and you tell your story to me. And then she wouldn't want to tell her story either. And then she says, next, and I'll go up and I'll, you sit in the front row and I'll tell to you. So I thought, fine. So I'm just starting to tell her the story, but I'm getting into it like I am here. And it takes over its own life because it's still so real. It just feels like I'm, I'm telling it for the first time. And, and it was funny. It's funny now, but I, the room, usually there's people talking, there's papers rattling and all this other stuff, but I'm telling you, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. Cause all these people are believers, you know, they know I was there and uh, there's been a few people, Nancy Evans Bush and Howard Storm did it. They've written really wonderful books about their experience, but it was so wonderful to, to right at the very end, man, when I'm at the end, they're on the edge of their seats. And when I tell how I got out, I mean, they clapped. Yay, <laughs> we got out. They were with me all the way. And that really turned things around for me. I thought, you know, this disaster that I think I've gone through, this is going to help people. And so it's taken me another 10 years to write the book. I was finally bullied into that. And I uh, got that out. It took me uh, a full year of sitting down doing nothing else. Thank you, COVID. Uh, and I got that done and then found the um, publisher at a conference, an IONS conference. And, and then, so I just started um, doing podcasts. You know, I didn't know how to advertise my book, or, but people found me. And uh, I love it. I love being able to tell people. And this is, this, this is what I'm here to say. You don't, nobody has to go to hell. Nobody. I planned it. I expected it. I wasn't disappointed. I got to go, but you don't have to. Uh, God is just love. God loves us unconditionally. You can't make God mad. I mean, God loves you no matter what. And so we all belong to God. We're all pieces of God, of the same spirit. Uh, from my friends up at IONS, I've learned from many, many, many people who really believe, and I do now too, that we plan our lives to come down to earth or whatever other planet we want to go to and, and learn lessons because in heaven, everything's perfect. So you can't really know anything else until you have something to contrast it to. So if you want to really know what empathy is, if you really want to know what courage is, you really want, you know, you plan your little lessons. You've got your, your, your gang of soulmates. They come down pretty much the same time, maybe a little sooner, a little later. Yeah. Yeah. You meet up on the path, and I love this one because it's happened to me so many times. When when you meet somebody for the first time and you're, you're just getting along so well, and, and you kind of go, "Don't I know you? I know you from somewhere." Now, where is it? That that is it. That the restaurant, or, or and and that's the clue, pretty much that they're going to be a soulmate, even if they just you sit on uh, uh, next to them on the bus, and you have a conversation. There's it's all been pre-planned by you. And so what I love now is that I no longer feel like a victim. I mean, I had my first baby died a terrible death when she was two days old. I've had three divorces. I've had all kinds of stuff, just like most people in this life. And now instead of shaking my fist at God saying, why me? Why are you always picking on me? I sit back and say, hmm, what was I thinking? This is a lesson. I better learn it because I don't want to repeat it. And I don't feel like a victim. And I think that's huge. I think so many people are unhappy in this world because they feel like they're victims. But if they could understand, they planned it so they could learn things. It puts a whole different spin on it. It's, it's, it's almost like this is a play. We're, we're, we're doing our lines, we're learning things. It's, it's school, it's, it's temporary. And it's going to go by fast, even if you live to be 100. Well, you know how fast it can go. You have a baby and all of a sudden they're going to college. But it just makes life lighter. Uh, and when I came back, I still, you know, I'm human. There's still that this part of me that says, oh, no, I don't want to go to purgatory again. But, you know, I'm, I, I just can't help it. And so I, I said to God, oh, just even three years ago, I said, all right, I, you know how I am. I need something in writing. I need something I can, I can look at every day and tell me, I know you've told us 
you know, a million times, but give me something succinct. And I, boom, the voice says, loving and kind, be loving and kind. And I heard that for two days, be loving and kind, be loving. I said, okay, I got it. And then and about two or three months later is merciful and forgiving. Oh, there's four. Okay, loving, kind, merciful, forgiving. Down the road, encouraging, grateful. Encouraging, grateful. That's six, that's good. Non-judgmental and useful. That was it. We only got to eight so far. Uh, it's been several years. So that's when I get up in the morning, I got my nice picture of Jesus there. Uh, the one that kid draw, drew in uh, Heaven's Real or whatever. Yes. It's very lifelike. I love that picture. And I, I said, oh, dear Jesus, help me to be loving, kind, merciful, forgiving, encouraging, grateful, non-judgmental, and useful. Now, the miracle in that is I can't remember hardly anything anymore, but that's like <laughs> seared somewhere inside my soul. And so that's another thing. I put that on my little bookmarkers from, with my book. I put that on the back. If, if everybody just did those eight things, got up in the morning and said, help me to do this, get in a rough situation, say, okay, if you can't remember anything, do the loving and kind. But really, Jesus and all the other teachers we've ever had, it, it, it boils down to being loving and kind. And so don't worry about hell. You won't go. If you don't believe in it, if you don't give it power, if you believe in God's 100% love of you and do those eight things. Amen. Wow. Wow. Kathy, you're amazing. I just want to say thank you for being so vulnerable and so inspiring. <laughs> my gosh, I feel like clapping and cheering you are amazing. Oh, dear. I want you on my team. My gosh, you are tough. <laughs> oh, well, what you, what I you, planned it, I guess. <laughs> what you consciously experience. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Oh, go for it. Oh, I mean, I just can't even imagine what you went through. It's just what you say you planned and you created with your consciousness that in some way was a perception of your reality. In all of these experiences, before the time you started singing the Christmas carol, did you think to pray to God for help or guidance prior to that? I had no concept of God, none. Oh. And I was I was thinking about that a lot later because I've heard of some people saying I called out to God and I thought, yeah. good grief, that didn't even cross my mind. But for me, we were taught that God doesn't go where God is not wanted. And my my feeling, my understanding is... Nobody wants God in hell. And so he doesn't go. Not he, God mm -hmm. doesn't go. Um, and that was part of my trial. Uh, I was, uh, took four years of Latin and we did the Greek odysseys and all of those things. And, and what flashed back to me was all those times we read about the guy, you know, the, the hero when he had to go down into hell and save Persephone or whoever it was. And find the golden fleece or whatever the heck that was with Jason. And that was not there, but anyway, he comes up and he gives all this message to mankind. This is what you need to do. So I think the people to me, I've been told, well, Nancy Evans Bush says, they're the brave ones. The ones that go to hell, they're the brave ones. Uh, they come back and they give a message that nobody else wants to go get. <laughs> and it's, it's not that the message hasn't been here before, but we all need to be reminded. And uh, so that's why I'm here. And when I get it all done, when I reach every person I'm supposed to reach, I get to go home. And I'm going to chase down that friend of mine. <laughs> and <we're, laughs> He owes me a glass of wine or something, that's for sure. Well, um, I think you're one of the bravest people that I know. Um, gosh, just in such a remarkable experience. It just shows how darkness or fear can so block you, block your mind from thinking for your best and highest good. You really had, you just couldn't think. Mm -hmm. it just, no, just you just have, they have to have that strength inside Mind control, you. sorry, is probably the term I'm thinking well, of. Well, uh, well, the strength has to come from in. And I, all those years, I mean, I was a really devout Catholic and um, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't perfect, but I did mass a lot. I did the rosary. I did all the prayers. I, I did all that. And that was just who I was. So it was such a shock to find myself there. 
but I think I had the strength because I did have all that grace that I'd garnered through the years, unbeknownst to me, to uh, help me through that. And just to clarify, you didn't choose to come back into your humanness when you were in that heaven-like uh, realm. No. <laughs> you wanted <laughs> to you're stay. In heaven, you want to stay. It's so wonderful. You can't even explain it. Every wonderful thing that ever happened to you, you know, times a million, you know, it's, it's peace and joy at the same time. It's just giggly laughter and, and and there's so much to do there. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't allowed in. Um, uh, I, I thought later too, if I'd seen my little girl, they couldn't have got a, me out of there with a crowbar. So I was a good thing they 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 had me see my friend because he and I were always joking with each other, and he was saying, "I'll I'll send her back. I'll send her back." Uh, just uh, just because we did that kind of thing. And when, when you saw, I think, loved ones, what, did they look like they would in their physical form and your fiancé? I saw two. I saw two, yeah. And, and I saw two that were living uh, relatives that I had to go back and give messages. Try doing that. Hey, I was in hell the other day and saw you, and I've got a message for you. That doesn't go over well, believe wow. me. Um, uh, so I was a little more tactful than that. But the first person... It ruined our relationship. I just said, I've got this thing to tell you, you need to work on. This is not, this is not your higher and best self and you might need to look at that. Uh, we, we, we had a, a rocky couple of months and then it was over. I haven't heard from her since 20 years. Um, but the other person, uh, I told her and she kind of blinked like it made sense because she was in a really bad relationship and uh, it involved food, not for her, but she was learning to cook for a certain person for a certain reason. And that just wasn't who she was, but she felt um, compelled at, to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to say much more than that. That's so fine. eventually years later, she got divorced and it was not too long ago. Uh, a couple of Christmases ago where she kind of sidled up to me and said, would you mind telling me that thing again? And I said, sure. And she goes, oh my God, it was spot on. And I says, yeah, and I'm glad you had the guts and the courage to stop it. So that was good. And what 50% about, of them. <laughs> yes. What about the lady that you saw that you knew in this physical realm who had all the piles of food? That was her. Oh, okay. That the was piles of food. Oh, okay. Yeah. She was, she was becoming, a very good cook for, uh, but it wasn't what she wanted to do. And uh, to impress people that she didn't want to impress for someone. And uh, so she was being used. And, and when we do things. So others. sad. Oh, she just was withering, withering. So I, I think that gave her the courage to uh, take the leap and do it. But anyway, it turned out well. Yes, well, that's great. And and mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, you hear a, a voice or it's a lot louder. Sometimes, often people return fundamentally changed from the near-death experience was obvious that, gosh, you did, but people can often say they return with heightened spiritual consciousness or heightened gifts. Did you um, recognise any of those elements? There's, there's uh, something in me that uh, um, if I'm around a stranger, it happens a lot, like sitting on an airplane. It's an incredible number of times in a crowd waiting for some place. They'll turn to me and say, oh, how are you? I say, oh, fine, how are you? Oh, I just came from my dad's funeral. I just, I hope there's a heaven, you know, or, or my, my, all these things that came up that they, why do you talk to a stranger about that? Mm -hmm. And then we'll end up talking an hour. I've, I've had ladies, two ladies, I sat with in airplanes months apart. They, they chat. Uh, one was, oh, my God, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't run into you today. I was at my wit's end. Uh, another one walked me all the way to the baggage claim to introduce me to her husband and say, this wonderful woman just explained to me what's going on. I mean, that's been really cool. Uh, so that's something I didn't ask for, but... That's one of the things. 
almost like a messenger of hope, really, or to alleviate yes, fear. Gosh, somebody. you've experienced the ultimate fears of most people. Um, what would oh, you, what, you probably get this question all the time. What would you say to people <laughs> that are afraid of dying or maybe close to dying well, or in the process? I, of love what, I love what Woody Allen said. He said, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. And I think that's how a lot of people feel. You know, they want to be in heaven, but ooh, it's scary. And I've got a good story about my dad. You know, he 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 died in uh, about the COVID on uh, January 8th. And I wasn't able to be there. And thank God my family was because they all got COVID too. So they were able to take him home from the hospital and he could die there at my sister's house with my mom and sister and all that. But he and I had talked so much about dying ahead of time. He's his first, his, he was the first Catholic in our family. He was an atheist and he, his plane went down in World War II and he never got to tell the story. So about two years ago, I said, dad, I'm gonna write a book and I want you to tell that story finally because it's a good way to start how, how our, our spirituality started in our family. Yes. So he got, to, he got to do, that was cool. And he was a pilot and he, he I had said to him one time, okay, what are you gonna do when you get to heaven? And I says, great. Oh, he says, do you, I really think I can. I says, yeah, you don't even need a plane. I says, just, we had such good conversations back and forth. So when he, when he, and I says, and also dad, you won't be alone um, from my work at hospice and, and from all people I've told, uh, been told about when you die, there's always going to be somebody to show up and take you. All right. And, and you look toward the ceiling or the corners of the room. That's where they come in. And there can be one, usually two. Uh, it, some people see 20, you know what I mean? It, mother will get 20 uh, people to come, but, but he, he, he believed me, you know? And so when he was passing, I was told a couple hours later after he died, um, uh, he was kind of struggling because he couldn't breathe and, and he was kind of tense. And uh, all of a sudden he stopped and he looked up at the ceiling and he got this big smile on his face and then he died. Oh. And, and they said, oh, my God, he saw somebody. Who do you see? Who do you see? Well, it's funny because my publisher is a medium. And she and I never talked about medium stuff. We only talked about physical stuff. And shortly before, well, just no, it was just after he died then, uh, we were talking about something businesslike. And she goes, um, who's Mary? I said, I'm Mary. She says, no, the other Mary. Who's the other Mary? And I thought, what's she talking about? And I says, well, my grandmother, is that your father's mother? And I says, yeah. She goes, oh. So then she says, all right, you got an aunt? And I said, yeah. Is she dead? I said, yeah. I said, your dad's sister? I says, what's this all about? Well, he said to tell you that when he died, his mom and his sister came to, t to greet him and wanted you to know. And I thought, oh, my God, how cool. That's and she amazing. says, oh, wait a minute. He's got something else. Uh, he was a pilot, right? And I says, yeah. And he says, well, he said to tell you that the takeoff was a little bumpy, but he landed safely. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Isn't that fun? So, my, of course, my sister and everybody is saying, oh, no, he saw my brother. Oh, no, he saw so-and-so. And I said, no, I know who he saw. But he did see. So you're not going to go alone. There'll be people that show up. So, Kathy, you've written a, your book, which is so exciting. Do you want to hold it up? I don't know if you want to read something from it. <laughs> uh, it's called Misfit in Hell to Have an Expat. And I'll tell you, the misfit in hell is kind of obvious because I kept telling them I wouldn't do it and they kicked me out. The have an expat thing is because my friend who I saw in heaven uh, was worked for a big company. They sent him to India one time, they sent him to China one time, and he was an expat. He joined the expat club. So that's because they're expatriates and they're people that work, they live in one country, they work in another country when they get their job done in the, the other country, they come home and they're, no, and they're ex, no longer expats, they're back home. So I was a heaven expat, you're a heaven expat, we're all heaven expats. We start in heaven, we come down here to work, we get our work done, we go home. Amazing. And 
your all your details will be in the show notes but where's the best place for people to contact you uh contact me yes. i've got a website it's just the same title as the book www.misfitinhelltoheavenexpat.com sorry it's so long but the voice made me do it that's okay and i'll then put the I, link I, anyway <laughs> <laughs> okay and then amazon's a good place to, to look and i just got the audible version out too that took me a year to get I think, so. I think congratulations. Again, I've asked most of the questions. Is there anything else on a final note you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience? God is good. It's, it's, we're just here for a short time. Enjoy it. And you're going to go home. Oh, well, Kathy McDaniel, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. You're, welcome. you're such you. an inspiration and thank you're you. very brave. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> if you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.